Shalom, welcome to The Jewish View. My name is Rabbi Nachman Simon with the Chabad House of Delmar, together with my co-host Mark Gronich of jbiztechvalley.com and Statewide News. We have a very, very, very special guest with us, Mr. Harry Rosenfeld, the editor-at-large at the Times Union. Harry, welcome to The Jewish View. Thank you. It's great to have you here, Harry. You know, in a previous episode of this program, we, had, we talked about your book, From Kristallnacht to Watergate, and we talked about Kristallnacht. Now we want to talk about Watergate, and we want to, uh, you know, which happened, I guess, between 69 and 74. There was well, it happened 72, in 72. 72 to 74. 72 was the actual break-in. Right. But the... Well, it goes on until the Nixon resignation. Right. Well, you were the Metro editor at the Washington Post at that time, so you were... You were the man. I mean, you're not just an observer. You were there. You were, you were the key person. Well, the Metro it. staff covered the Watergate because Watergate began as a burglary. And burglary are the stuff that a local news operation covers. What Watergate became, a national political scandal of the first magnitude, is something that in the normal world of journalism, would be covered by the national desk. But by the time <laughs> the air cleared, we on local had such a firm grasp on it and wouldn't let go that we kept control of it throughout the major investigative portion of, of uh, the exposure of Watergate for the crime against the nation that it was. Now, when it comes to your book, I got to tell you, I, you already know this, but it said Tom Brokaw said it was an American, it's a great American story, an inspiring saga. And Bob Woodward, who was one of the reporters, said a terrific memoir by one of the great newspaper men of the, cent of the era, and Carl Bernstein, the other Watergate reporter, a great and moving tale. And th that's phenomenal to have such people of high stature talk about your book that way. And Woodward I, you know. and Bernstein were working for you at that time? They were indeed, yes. Mm. And in fact, I had hired Woodward. Woodward, uh, Bernstein was already there when I joined the Metro staff, uh, but Woodward was hired while I was editor. Mm -hmm. In 1970, I believe. And before the Washington Post, you were at the New York Herald, which was no, highly No, New York Herald Tribune, please. Here, Herald yeah. Tribune, That's okay. A, yes, right. I see that here. And then you, and that was a, a, not such a thriving paper, but you were working day and night to try to keep it afloat. Absolutely. And then when that didn't come to pass, you moved on to the Washington Post. That's exactly what happened. Well, finally, I got something exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I always come close. No, no, but you can't just knock off the Tribune and leave you it know. in the dustbin <laughs> of history, you know. And I remember back in the 70s, there was the New York Tribune that tried to come back for a few months and years. <laughs> it, it was a year's a year? long struggle. That's oh, my well, years long. Oh. It was terrible. But was anyway. Um, it was a great newspaper. I mm -hmm. want you to know, we went down in flames, but, but there was a lot of energy there, <laughs> a lot of creativity, we, and a lot of things that were then became commonplace in, in journalism generally were incubated at the Herald Tribune. Have you met any of the president, all the president men, have you met any of the president's men personally? In I have shaken hands with five presidents. Just consider right. that for half a moment. Okay. A refugee kid arrives here in 1939, 107 days before the beginning of World War II. And before he checks out, mm -hmm. he has shaken hands with five presidents. Can you imagine that? I could not imagine that. In fact, looking back on it, I can't even imagine that. So which but five? But it's sort of a triumph of what America is about. Yeah. So which five? Which five? Ha <laughs> ha, you Thanks. are a tough man. <laughs> <laughs> there was Ford. Okay. There was Carter. Uh huh. There was Reagan. Uh huh. There was uh, the first Bush. Okay. I'm leaving someone. So you missed Clinton? Right? Uh, Clinton. You did. Oh, oh, oh but you I forgot Clinton. Clinton. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, after the first, after Bush 41, you didn't, uh, you tailed off. You didn't meet. Clinton the, comes after Bush 41. I hate to correct you again. Yeah, no, but I meant you didn't meet the yeah. Bush 43 or? No. Okay. I did not meet 43. I did okay. not meet Obama. Okay. You want to, though? 
I wouldn't mind. Maybe it. they'll see the program. Yeah, and yeah, they'll, yeah, right. <laughs> have public in. access. <laughs> but maybe he's jumped up and he won't be washing. You know. <laughs> Do you have, you know, so you met how many of the president's men, though? How many of them? Of the president's men. How do I know? Did you I don't know that I met a lot of them. No. no. Okay. Uh, Dean? We weren't on speaking acquaintance. Dean? John Dean? Did you? I've met him subsequently, but I didn't meet him while. No, but subsequently, how many of the presidents? Oh, John? I don't know. I can't okay. begin to tell you. Okay. Did you ever have an affinity that you wanted to interact with them, or did you think all oh, those? I didn't think one way or the other about it. You don't? Never okay. even occurred to me. Oh, okay. It was not a matter of interest. <laughs> Um, Did you, I mean, when you were starting the story, you were suspecting this was going to be a, an amazing, it's one of the biggest chapters no, in no, American no, no, history no, no, altogether. No, 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 no. We thought it was a very good story for the local staff. A, an unusual story for the local staff because it was, the break-in was at Democratic National Headquarters in the Watergate complex where only the wealthiest people lived. It had all the elements of a good story. That's all I saw, and that's all that I, I, I wasn't really interested in. Two weeks into the story, when John Mitchell resigns as head of the committee to re-elect the president, remember, they were in the early stages of the presidential re-election cam campaign. It occurred to me that he didn't step down because, he, as he said publicly, he had to take care of Martha, his wife, who unfortunately had a, 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 an alcohol problem. I didn't believe that. I, I, had, I had met John Mitchell, oh, okay. and I, I had taken my measure of him when he was attorney general, and this was one hombre, you know. Mm -hmm. He would not resign the president's re-election campaign in order to take care of his wife. So I knew this was better than the story that we were already very engrossed in, because it was such a good story for us. And from there on, as we uncovered more and more, slice by slice, the scandal, well, it became obvious as we went higher and higher in the echelon of the involvement of the Nixon administration. And also by their reactions, by their attempts to obfuscate, uh, to uh, prevent us, to challenge us, uh, it became obvious this was a very, very serious thing. How serious? I never, I never thought it would, I never had in my mind that it's going to get to the president. Mm -hmm. I thought it would get pretty high up, but it wouldn't get, I didn't think the president would be involved. At one point after Agnew had resigned for other reasons, right. a friend asked me whether he thought Nixon would resign, and I said, oh, of course not. This country would never sit still for both a president and a vice president resigning, you know. See how right I was? <laughs> About as right as I am with some of the things that I've been saying <laughs> so far. But uh, uh, what was your, uh, did you have to push Woodward and Bernstein or did they push no. you? No, no, you didn't have to push them. They knew exactly what they had when they had it. I mean, they were, um, it was a very good story for us from the beginning. And, it, and everybody on our local staff knew it was. So many people besides Woodward and Bernstein were involved throughout. And everybody was very up for it and very, very focused on it. And nobody needed any inspiration or bucking up. Uh -huh. The contrary, I had to try to get them to take some time off. Were you, you know, uh, as the editor, looking at their stories and saying, no, we need to verify this, you need to verify it from two sources, you need to make sure that we're well, right? We, I, I made them, yes, I made them sure. And it wasn't two sources. Uh, because that became sort of a mythological thing, to my regret. Two sources, it depends on the sources. One source can be a diamond, and ten sources can be brass. That's right. So it's not the number of sources, it's the quality of the source. But when I had Bill uh, Rowley in my journalism, as my journalism teacher at UAlbany, he said two sources, so <laughs> I'm just going with that. That's but what's you are, wrong with journalism but in, education. But in real life, you're right. There could be one source yeah. that's a diamond and I mean, ten that are look, brass. In the nature of things, two <laughs> sources would be better than one, three would be better, better than two, two, four would right, be better than three. Know. But the quality of the yes, sources has, right. is more important. Right. right. Uh, more quality than quantity, right. 
Uh, what qual it, a quantity is good, good if they're good sources. Right, exactly. It's, that's why I mean by quality is more important than yes, quantity. Yes, yeah. right. Uh, so when you, when you saw these, you know, Woodward and Bernstein bring you the copy, and you're saying, wow. Well, that didn't work that way. They had an editor, Barry Sussman, okay. and they, they, they worked with him. Okay. And when they and and they, I was in on and they were going to do this, they were going to do that, mm -hmm. and I had my say at that point, uh, if I had anything to say. No, sure. They knew the story better than I did, and in uh, because they knew what, what sources to go to. Mm -hmm. The more we reported, the more information we got. People contacted us right. because we were the only paper in the United States. Uh, that at that time was doing the Watergate stories, and people who had some experience with the dirty tricks, with the slush funds, with other things, contacted us, and, and so we ran those things down. Some were good, but we couldn't find the proof. Mm -hmm. Some were off the wall, and some were very, very good. We were able to su su substantiate them and write the stories that we did. And, and when did Deep Throat come into the picture? Well, Deep Throat was, uh, was Bob Woodward's uh, acquaintance way before he joined the Washington Post. He had been a uh, naval officer. He served five years in the Navy as an officer uh, and a good part of the time in Washington as part of the intelligence department of the Navy. It's one of the things that attracted me to him. I never had somebody who was both a naval officer and intelligence officer mm. at the same time. Um, so he had, they had met while he was in the Navy, and they had met in the White House. And they had formed a relationship. And he was made, a, able to make use of that relationship because Mark Felt was a high official in the FBI. So, and, and when it finally came out just several years ago, you know, that Mark Felt was, the, was Deep Throat, did you like, well, I didn't know who that was, or what well, was I know very well who Mark Felt was. You did. He was okay. the number two man to, to J. Edgar Hoover. So uh -huh. if I if I am the Metropolitan Editor right. in, in Washington, I don't know who the number two man is the in, in the FBI. That would be a pretty well. Sad you said commentary. well. You you also said that you were more you, your team was more in terms of were covering crime and you that's know, true and not you, FBI. You knew, so but you knew who. Who are the department heads and and whatnot uh, in the in oh, of course in the you cabinet. did oh, okay. of course you did and 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 uh, I had asked Woodward at one point to tell me his name because nobody was only Woodward source nobody else's and he said he would if I insisted but I should be aware that he had given a sworn word that he would not reveal it because the man's career, if not more, could be in danger. So in that split second, I decided it was best to leave it as it was, because I was sure we would be dragged into court by the Justice Department, mm -hmm. we would be put under oath, and I wouldn't lie, and I, and less is more, wouldn't so lie, and I, less we, is I wanted more. as many people as possible to remain free to conduct the mm -hmm. investigation. Woodward would not tell. He would go to jail. So the, um, the, the term of art that came out of the Watergate thing was plausible deniability, right? I mean, there was that expression that all of a sudden became, uh, that, that became a term of art after that. So I guess that would be your equivalent that you had plausible deniability. Yes, you I didn't did not want... know, therefore <laughs> I... I, I yeah. And you must remember that as good a source an important source as Deep Throat was. He didn't come in and he didn't tell Woodward, one, two, three, four, five, right. now go no, get no. the story. He said, go get this no, one or no? No, no, he did not. He no, didn't no, point no, no, no. He, he provided guidance, he provided right. context, he provided confirmation. Uh, he, he said, we're on the right track, we're on the wrong track. Uh -huh. But he didn't come bearing secrets and say, here, here, go follow this lead. No. So was the movie off? Yes. With that, because well, if the I don't remember the movie that well, but if you're saying that the movie said he he gave those kinds of direct he instructions, he said he said you know you should talk to so and so. 
Well, he may, and have, he may indeed that type have, of thing, you have know. said that. I yeah. don't know. But in the movie, he did. I wasn't so. in on the conversations. Right, exa exactly. But I'm just. But neither was Alan Pakula, right? <laughs> the director. Yeah, no, I know. Nor William yeah. Goldman, the scriptwriter. So, you know. <laughs> so the, and I just wanted to, um, uh, f you know, I've, I wanted to find out, you know, what your thinking was. You were, what, in your 40s when you were there? At, At the that time? time, I was. You were in your 40s. You were a young man. You were. I, I mean, was a baby for looking for that from my I mean, situation now. But yeah, I mean, so, and and you've just been through the hell of New York Herald Tribune and what went on there. I mean, was this something? Was this scary for you? Frightening for you? Or did this get your juices flowing? Like, oh, I got you know. It was not frightening. It was. It was serious business. Mm -hmm. I had to concentrate. I had to stay focused. I had to make sure that what we put in the paper was right. I yeah. know the world would come down crashing on us if we were wrong. And, and I knew what that would mean for the Washington Post, and I knew what that would mean <laughs> for me personally. And, in, the, and uh, in your book, you describe a situation where you were not totally accurate on one of the stories. Yes. Why don't you well, tell we us were about not it? accurate on other parts, too. <laughs> but this was the most serious in my mind. So. And it came out of an effort to put a name to confidential sources. Because Bradley was being taunted by the Republicans, but that was steady. And that Brad we were doing, but it was when he was being taunted by his friends who said, how come we don't have any names? Why is it always a confidential source? So he said, get me a name to go into the newspaper. And the reporters, being dutiful, tried to get that name into the newspaper. And they thought they had gotten it, but they had misunderstood the conversation that they had with this particular source, whose name would be put in the newspaper, for having testified to the fact that Bob Haldeman, the chief of staff to Nixon, was the fifth and last man to be identified as the controller of a slush fund that was paying all these for all these dirty tricks that were going on. And that involved huge sums of money. And when you name Haldeman, you're naming Nixon. Because the chief of staff to the president, his job is to be there for the president. So if he's not telling the president what he knows, he's not doing his job. So we knew what, how serious this was. Turned out that there was a misunderstanding. And while Haldeman was the last person to control the fund that we identified, we had identified the other four earlier, he had, it had not been testified to, to the grand jury. Why? Because the government prosecutors didn't ask the witness. Mm. Now, why didn't they ask the witness? I don't know, because I can't read minds, but I know they were government prosecutors, and the government was committing the crimes. So, you, but, so the, the story was inaccurate in the sense that if he had asked this question, if the government prosecutors had asked this question, the answer would have been Haldeman. Yeah, it was you know, inaccurate so. <laughs> that we said it was testified to, to the grand jury. It was not. It was not. But if it had been asked... And he would have answered honestly because right. the man was not a perjurer. So you, so you had the story, the, the essence of the story, right? But you just well, had Well, the essence this, of the story yeah. was that Haldeman controlled the fund. Right, so what happened... The, the, the right. touch was uh, to put Haldeman's name, right. to put a, a name to it, and the name was Hugh Sloan, who was the former financial director of the Committee to Re-elect the President. Uh -huh. And, it, and his name was put to it, and he hadn't testified to it. So, so what happened uh, to you and the paper and all well, this? Well, there was uh, a great deal of turmoil. And I couldn't find uh, a person in Woodward. They were instructively off with their publisher to be talking about a book. Nice. While I was going out of my mind, what went wrong here? We had a, I had to beg Bradley to not uh, withdraw the story publicly. So we found out what, what our mistake was. And Bradley is Ben Bradley. Ben Bradley, the executive editor. Okay. And, and he agreed, although other people were urging him simply to say we, we withdraw the story. 
Well, I thought it would be scandalous for us, triply scandalous for us, to withdraw a story that later on would turn to be out to be effectually true, but wrong in some detail, as indeed it turned out to be. And the detail was uh, that we were wrong about it being testified to the grand jury. Mm -hmm. But the substance, the was, substance was that Haldeman, mm -hmm. the president's chief of staff, used his money to fund dirty tricks campaigns. So that was the story. So was that the beginning of the end for Nixon? Because it was know. so close? I don't know when the beginning of the end is. You're well into 19, 19, 1974. Right. Because you can, get, you can begin to talk about the beginning of the end. Because it was only then that both the courts, the U.S. Right. District Court, and the committees of the House and of the Senate began to look into different aspects of the Watergate scandal. They hadn't done so in 72 and 73. In 74, they began to do so. They had the power, subpoena power. They could compel testimony under oath. Last mm -hmm. time I looked, an editor did not have this power. My job would be a lot simpler if I had the power. I don't know why they didn't give it to me. I would have given it to me, but they decided not to give it to me. You know, you, you mentioned something, and I saw this editorial in the Times Union, and they had a, a graphic of Nixon and Andrew Cuomo, and you had all the tapes uh, drawn in the back. You know what I'm talking no. about? It said, did we learn anything from Watergate, and are we still being secretive in the governor's administration, the current governor's administration? Are we still being secretive, that, you know, as compared to the Watergate administration? Uh, well, I thought you might have had a hand in writing remember, no, that. No, I should I, have no, brought I, it with me that, because I... <laughs> no, no. I sit on the editorial board, uh, well, you but must I, don't read the, I don't recollect that... Um, that cartoon. That cartoon the, or that editorial. Oh, okay. But I am not for secrecy in government, no, whether either. it's the state government or right. the federal government or the city government. No, I'm not either. Do you I'm, think I'm, that things have progressed? I mean, do, has the country and politicians learned from Watergate saying that? I mean, you know, obviously it was one of the biggest chapters in American history, so everybody knows it. But, I mean, is government the same or maybe even worse? You know, at all, like you're saying, all these the secrets involved? Have we well, I think uh, if you're talking about today, look, look what's happening. Mm -hmm. The Obama administration is, is vigorous and... and, and intimidating the, uh, its own people to keep them from talking out of turn to newspeople, to media people, right. to journalists. They have been more draconian, it is believed, than any other recent, any other administration, while at the same time proclaiming that they're more open. And same thing I with think Andrew you can Cuomo. make the argument on both sides, yeah. but uh, there's a distinct feeling among all uh, 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 the, the media that they are really using the powers of the Justice Department and exaggerating their powers to harass the press and to harass the people to keep them from departing from the company line. What all administrations fear is the people who work for them who then speak off the rule book. You know? mm -hmm. They say something that the administration power doesn't want said. Mm -hmm. Has that changed for the better? Absolutely not. Have they learned? They only learn temporarily. The reforms that were instituted in the wake of Watergate to keep it from happening again have largely been withdrawn. The special prosecutor is no more, very key in Watergate. By the time of Clinton, he's on a, he's on a witch hunt, he, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the financial reforms that we were supposed to keep election uh, uh, campaign contributions, some funding being used for legal purposes. No, the parties wanted that money more than they, they uh -huh. wanted the restriction. Right. And the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court says, money is speech. To me, I'm sorry, speech is speech and money is money. money. Yeah. You are right, and I just and want- And that's today. Uh, yeah. The business with the FISA court, uh -huh. look at the trouble with it. They, they, they had, uh, a ban on assassination? Well, we do assassinations routinely now with drones. They had uh, um, uh, a ban on oh, a congressional oversight of 
in domestic intelligence operations? Well, look what was revealed about the uh, NSA. Mm -hmm. They had all sorts of domestic operations that by law they were not supposed to have. So when you see that, let's say the FDR administration, a Democratic administration, had these issues against the, uh, people who were saying they were anti-Semitic, Voyage of the Damned, and other aspects back then. Then you have Nixon, who's a Republican president. Um, you know, Republicans, Democrats, they all have their faults, it seems. And you've lived through it all. Uh, how, you know, how, how do you come down? Do you, are you more of a Democrat still than a Republican, or are you neutral? I'm a political independent. I, since I became an editor, I have not been a registered anything. Okay. I have my, I have my very distinct points of view. Okay. I'm not going to tell you what they are. Okay. They're none of your business. All right. And, and, uh, and that's true. Uh, <laughs> I feel the same way, Harry. I as, tell you. as you should. I do. As you should. I do. And uh, so I think people in government have a tendency to feel self righteous. They know they're good people, they know their hearts are pure. They're only doing this for the betterment of the, of the public. That's their perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whether that's wholly true or partially true or entirely false, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way they feel. Mm -hmm. They're always thinking they're doing the right thing. I don't think they're, even when they're doing the wrong thing. I mean, <laughs> Nixon was a trained lawyer. Yeah. He had, no, he was breaking the law. Right? And, yeah. and even if you're not a trained lawyer, you have trained lawyers all around you, right? Well, Pata you gotta know Pata when you're breaking Pataki the law. Pataki must have known what he, that what he was doing was wrong to Bruno or or um, Bruno? no no no, um, no no Spitzer had to know what he was doing wrong to Bruno. I don't think he and, did anything wrong to Bruno. What was he doing wrong to Bruno? You tell me. Well, with keeping tabs on him so close. He was keeping tabs on what money was public money was being expended that was not being accounted for by Bruno because Bruno was flying all over the universe on political trips and charging it to the taxpayer. Okay. What's wrong with that exactly? Well, he was on, he was on uh, government business. No, no, he, he, he was on government business five minutes and he was on his own business for hours. But, he, but that was legal. I don't think it was legal. The courts certainly, are those certainly. Well, courts also make mistakes. I, 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 I think he had every right to track the use of the of the government airplanes. Okay, so the trooper gate you thought was. I think it's nonsense. Nonsense. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I just feel I like know, there's. Here, yeah, I know it's a very big tangent. So, but it's nice to get your thoughts on. On these other topics, I don't know also. why we're there from Watergate. I don't know okay. either, but you know, I just the, uh, only because Trooper Gate, you know, the the the, the, the well, everything gets gate. attached to everything. Everything gets gate, now. right? Right. Yeah. I think once you're talking about modern, and I mean, you are the even though you were the editor of the Times Union, now you're the right. emeritus. But can you give us one story that you think is the highlight of? I mean, you have your Watergate, and of course Washington D.C., but here you're in Albany. The Times Union, like a major breakthrough or major story? Well, we did many major stories when I was editor, I'm proud to say. And one of them was about Jim Coyne and the, what is now called the Times Union Center, how it was built, and, and the payoffs and whatnot that went back and forth. Uh, we helped put Mr. Jo Coyne in jail. I mean, we didn't put him in jail. No, the course, government yeah. prosecuted him. But why did the government prosecute him? Because we wrote the stories about the briberies and whatnot and the I, payoffs. I, I, I always scratch my head about this, that it was only $30,000. If you're going to do something that Jim Coyne took $30,000, well, if you're going to do something, do it for bigger amounts of money. <laughs> you're assuming that there was only $30,000. I don't see how well, I can't so. read minds, and I can exactly. only look at... Exactly, but you can only... He was convicted of that. That yeah. doesn't mean there was not more. But I can only go by what, just right. like you would but, say to me... But, but you are, on the other hand, you can't say he only did it for 30000 According to the, what he was convicted on. He was convicted of doing that. Okay. <laughs> so, so that was one of the big... How long were you Metro editor in the Washington Post? How many years? From 1970... To 1976, about. Okay. Then you came to Albany. 
That's no, right. I came to Auburn in 1978. My last two years were I was assistant managing editor in charge of a, of a weekly opinion section called Outlook and the book reviews, which, which was a section called Book World and the daily book. We had daily book reviews as well. So I was in charge of those two operations. And you came to Albany. Then I came to Albany. And then you got to know Rastus Corning. I got to know the mayor, right. right. Okay. Anything else that you want to mention that we didn't bring up? Oh, my goodness. No, I think it's up to you to ask the question. I it's understand, up to me to but I always, I always leave the door open at the end. So. No, I, okay. I, you've done a very thorough job. Okay. We have two reporters in, but <laughs> we're out of time, and it is very, very interesting. Part one, which was the show before, was how Mr. Rosenfeld lived through the Kristallnacht, and now... Uh, you're an amazing historical figure, really, because, I mean, you went through two major, you know, like Watergate's one of the biggest historical situations in the United States. Crystal Knox probably the beginning of World War II. You were there, you were on the spot, so you're super very interesting, and I'm glad you came on the show. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for having me.